Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of 10 of the Best from Suited Aces Poker, where every week we watch hundreds of poker vlogger hands to bring you the very best 10 that we can find. I wanted to kick off this week though by saying a huge thank you to everybody that subscribed. This time last week, we were just shy of 100 subscribers looking to hit that milestone. And at the same time this week, we're just shy of 200 subscribers. So that's a big change week on week, and we really do appreciate it. If you're watching and you are yet to subscribe, there's the button. It's right down there. It's red. You can't miss it. Click to subscribe. We really appreciate it. Like the video. Give it the thumbs up. We appreciate all of that love too. So without further ado or begging for subscriptions, let's crack on with this week's 10 of the best. This week, we have some interesting bet sizing, some cracked aces, and one of those hands where you're just really pleased you win against that particular opponent. Let's make a start. At number 10 this week then, and Andrew Nimi is playing in the card club in Austin that he part owns with Brad Owen and Doug Polk and others, The Lodge. He's playing in a 2-5-10 cash game, and in this hand, Andrew hits the perfect flop. Or does he? Round two of Texas stand-up, a couple of folds to me on the button, and when you're playing a stand-up game, you can't let a suited one gapper go in position. I raise to $125 over a $40 straddle and get a mere four callers. Not a great result when you have four high, but that's okay when the flop comes down. Favorable. Action checks around to me, and I'm gonna continue here for the same sizing that I might if I had a hand like King Queen, betting in between a quarter and one third pot. The diaper in seat one has a vulnerable overpair and recognizes that I could be betting a wide range here and decides he wants to thin the field for a raise up to $375. The other two get out of the way, and obviously we are continuing. If he happens to have a flush draw or combo draw like Ace-5 of spades, something like that, we want to keep him in and hope he improves with those hands, and we should be able to double through the stronger hands like Ace-Deuce pretty easily on later streets regardless. So I call. King of Hearts isn't a good one for my opponent, so now he checks it. I won't be checking, but don't want to blast out those drawing hands or the middling pairs, so I make a wager of around one-third pot. No way Andrew faces a one-outer again. Andrew could be doing this very light just so he uh, can sit down here. We're getting a little bit late in the game. Could he take another one-outer? Don't say it. Goes for 450. I like this sizing. Has Diaper thinking about it. Diaper does not like this King of Hearts here on the turn. Andrew's standing for a reason. We're playing the stand-up game. Win a pot, and there's the call. Yeah, it makes the call here. Nine from space would crush Andrew. Diaper is checking all rivers here, unless it's a nine. Oh my god, this cannot be happening! Wow. The second one-outer. Are you kidding me? What oh is happening? Oh my god! I'm getting pretty good at getting drawn out on by one outers, but the silver lining is that my opponent saved me $1,400 by just calling and not jamming over my bet. Granted, he loses to Kings Full and Quads, but maybe he's just a nice guy. Well, not so nice that he doesn't take this opportunity to make it rain on the dealer and announce that he's doing it with my money. And here yeah, comes. Baby. Oh, yeah. God. God. Money, baby. Making it rain. <laughs> Now needling Andrew. Andrew's money here on the table. Oh, they're Damon knows what to do there. Puts it right down the shirt. He's been to an establishment or two. But that nine. I can't, I can't, I can't believe I mean, how many one-outers can a guy take in a week. Number nine this week, and we're with Wolfgang at the Hustler Casino in California. He's playing in a 5-5 cash game. Let's ask you, what do you think of Wolfgang's bet sizing in this one? How many of you are betting the pot on this river? Next hand, we have 1100 in our stack. I have King Queen of Hearts, and Aram raises it up to $20. There's one call in between us, and I three bet him to 100 bucks. Only he puts in the call, the middle position caller gets out of the way, and we're heads up to a flop, which comes 10 7 deuce with two hearts. Pretty great board for us, and we have the betting action. You can't see because I have $300 stacks of yellows in front of the betting line, but I bet out for $50. 
and uh, Aram puts in the call. So we're going heads up to the turn here, which doesn't improve us. It comes with five of diamonds with 320 in the middle. I decide to check here. If he decides to take up the betting lead and bet, I'm obviously not going to be folding my two overs and the front door hard draw. So I really like my check here, just exercising a little bit of deception. He now decides to bet $225, which is definitely a large bet into the $320 pot. Hopefully he has a heart draw of his own and we can cooler him here on the river. So uh, I make the call and suddenly we're off to the river in a $900 pot, which bears the board, but it's the five of hearts. Bang! We river the flush. Great spot to be in here, but I'm in a tough spot here. I'm gonna ask you guys to leave a comment down below. Would you A, check in flow over to Aram when we make the flush? Would you B, lead out into Aram for around $300 into the $900 pot? Or would you see bet full pot here for $900 fully polarizing and putting him to the test? Let me know down in the comments what you guys would do and let's see what I do in the moment. I like to go for B, bet $300 into the $900 pot. I don't want him to check behind. We need to get value here when he called 225 on the turn. So it seems pretty obvious that I made a flush on the river, but I bet out for $300. Aram puts in the call. He only has one speed if you guys remember. He puts in the 300 bucks and I table my king queen of hearts. He ends up showing pocket queen so interesting decision from him not to four bet me pre-flop with the queens or check raise me on the flop or bet the turn for that matter but uh we're taking down that nearly fifteen hundred dollar pot with our rivered flush and uh seeing a heart on the river there has never felt so good number eight this week and rob rickerman is playing at the mgm grand in vegas he's in a two three cash game and let's be honest who doesn't love playing against drunk wild cards Next, we have Queen 10 suited in the big blind. A few new players who are clearly drinking heavily have recently sat and game has gotten much better. One of them opens for 25 for middle position. Button calls, I make the call. We go three ways to a flop, ace, six, deuce with two hearts. We've got the second nut flush draw. I check, original razor who is a wild card bets 50. Button calls, he has been very snug, so I'm keeping that in mind. 50 is a fair price, we make the call. We pick up a queen of diamonds on the turn, giving us a pair to go with our flush draw. I check. The aggressor announces another 50. Button looks like he wants to raise. He grabs some extra chips, but eventually decides on a call. I think if the button has two pair or better, he's definitely putting in a raise. So I make the call, looking for a heart. We don't get it, but we do improve with a 10 on the river. We make running two pair, but we're not quite sure if it's any good. I check, and the next opponent has 100 in his hand, but announces... 200. Uh, that's 100. Er, 100. 100. You said, you said 200. You said 200. Yeah, you got to yeah. oh. So he wants to switch the bet to 100, but he can't. Verbal is binding in Las Vegas, so the bet's going to be 200. That's what he announced before he slid anything across. Action is on the button, who looks like he has a tough decision. Looks like he's a little bit worried about me uh, behind. So unless he's doing a great acting job, I think he just has a big ace. And, uh... I have kind of a hidden two pair here. He's a little bit worried about what I'm going to do. He eventually tosses out a call. With all that in mind, like I said, I think the button raises with two pair or better on the turn. So I kind of just have to pay this one off. Don't really know what the aggressor has. So I toss out the 200. We get the good news. The aggressor had just a queen blank. Button had ace jack. So we take down a big pot with uh, a mediocre two pair here. Number seven this week, and Doug McCusker is at the Capitol in Sacramento, California. He's in a 1-3 cash game, and if you're new to the game, haven't been playing for very long, then pay attention. This is really a great example of the thinking that you should be doing in your head before action. I've been very quiet for the last hour or so, haven't really done too much, haven't been involved in too many hands. I decided to open up with eight five of clubs from the plus one position. Definitely not something I recommend or something I do normally, but in this case I did. I make it 15. I get called in three spots, including the player in the big blind. So we're going to go four ways to a flop with $61 in. So the flop comes out. 8-6-3 with the 8-6 of hearts. Pretty good flop for 8-5 of clubs, but my opponent now leads into me for $65, a rather a very large bet. And I've noticed that often when he uses this bet sizing in this type of position, betting into the pre-flop aggressor, that he's on a big draw like a flush draw or a combo draw. 
This is definitely a decision point of the hand. If the player has a big combo draw, he has plenty of equity, and I only have top pair with a weak-ass kicker. So I got two players behind me. I mean, folding is not unreasonable. There's a good chance I'm going to be drawn out on. Option number two would be just to call and see what comes on the turn. If it comes a heart, I can get away. If it doesn't, then I can continue. And the third and most risky option would be to call here. And when the turn card comes, and if it's a blank, if it doesn't connect with a flush draw or a combo draw or come ace high for the nut flush draw, I can raise and charge him for his draws and really punish him for betting his draws. The turn card comes as the king of diamonds. It doesn't complete the flush draw. doesn't hit any of those combo draws I'd be worried about, like 10, 9 of hearts, 9, 7 of hearts, 5, 7 of hearts, 4, 5 of hearts. Doesn't hit the nut flush draw unless he had ace king of hearts, which I think he would have re-raised. And he leads into me for $120. So I decided to stick with the plan. I decided that I'm going to charge him for his flush draw. And I raise to 370. And he goes into the tank and he's having a real difficult time. He's kept keeps on saying, I don't think I can let this go. I don't think I can lay this down. Nobody would fold this hand and so on and so on. At the time, I thought the best possible hand he could have is uh, king, queen of hearts, you know, top pair and a flush draw. And even if he has that, it would be really difficult for him to raise in that spot because it looks like my hand is very strong, like possible sets, ace, king, pocket aces, pocket kings, all those hands I would play this way. So my, I expect him to put in the crying call and then I'll be in position. If a heart comes, I can muck the hand. And if it doesn't come, I can either show it down or bet for value if I improve. So after several minutes of tanking, my opponent finally decides on going all in. That uh, caught me by surprise. I didn't expect this at all. I go, the best he can have is a king with a flush draw. Didn't think he would go all in in this spot. He has me covered. I have about $380 left. And my thinking at the time was that, okay, I have to wait the three combinations of king, queen, king, jack, and king, ten of hearts much, much heavier in my calculations to see if I have the right equity to call. After doing that, I decided to give it a two-thirds weighting for those three hands and a one-third weighting for the combo draws that I thought that he originally had. And from my calculations, I had a little bit over 25% equity even by giving him, you know, 67% of the hands having a king, queen, king, jack, or king, ten hearts. So I didn't like it at all, but I think that he could still be on a big combo draw and had was trying for some fold equity. Yeah, I, I don't like it. It's not the kind of spots I like to get myself into, but this is where I was at, and this is what I was thinking. And, uh, yeah, I just toss it in. And we get to see a run out. I'm hoping to catch an eight or a five. I catch an eight of spades on the end. And he flips over king, queen of hearts. And I show him the eight, five. And he just lost his shit. He cursed me out, calling me just about every name in the book. And it didn't stop after, like, the ham was over. It continued for hours. I'm serious. It continued for hours. At number six this week and close to broke is playing at the bike in Bell Gardens, California. He's in a huge 2550 cash game and he is making it all look real easy in this one. So we're looking in a pretty interesting situation when under the gun by the name of Eric decides to raise to $300 as because we now have the $100 straddle on, and it's pretty much going to be a constant for most of the session, so just beware. The stakes are getting massive, really big. Folds all the way to me, which I am in the straddle, and we look down at pocket jacks. This is a great situation for many reasons. Most importantly, that I can have a 3-bet here that's not junk. We now have a value hand. I go ahead and make it $1,100 because I am out of position. To be quite frank, $1,200 probably makes more sense as that we are out of position for the entirety of the hand. Either way, we're going to go ahead and get called from our opponent. Out of position, heading to a flop that comes 844 Rainbow. Pretty outstanding flop for our specific holding. The only thing that we do have to mention is here, 
It's very unlikely for our opponent to be hitting this flop. Besides pocket eights and maybe one or two combos of ace four suited, I think for the most part my opponent's going to have nines, tens, ace queen, ace jack, and ace ten suited. If that's the case, I got to go really small here. The pot is around $2,300. I'm going to go for a third or fourth size of the bet here. I make it $800 to go right in that perfect sweet spot. My opponent decides to make the call. As you guys can see, he has ace queen here. He's floating with just ace high, and the turn card is a miracle jack of clubs. We were ahead, but I mean, for me at this point, I don't know his holding, obviously. I've now got to target what I believe is a flush draw or an overly bluffed situation. I think by checking here, I allow my opponent to really take over the reins of the hand, and I show a ton of weakness. My hand's like ace-king, ace-queen, ace-jack, ace-ten, king-queen, king-jack, all pretty much give up here and possibly float depending on his sizing so i decided to tank check it over to him he takes the bait and bets fifteen hundred dollars obviously i think raising would be a complete misplay of the hand so i think about it for a moment before deciding on just making the call the river is a beautiful five of hearts changing nothing to the board texture i have the effect of nuts in my heart and at this point the only possible way i make any more money is by deciding to check it over to my opponent and as you guys can see that was the perfect play, or at least in this instance, it was. Like I said, I, I let him hang himself, and he does, to the tune of an all-in. Just shy of $5,000, we beat him into the pot. I let him know immediately that we do have ourselves a set of jacks that turn into a beautiful boat on the on the turn here. The biggest pot of my life, that was it, right there. And it's, uh, it's, it's really fascinating to see it back in real time unbelievable i'm overwhelmed in emotions but i'm keeping my poker face on Seventeen thousand american us dollars shout out to inflation as uh, i don't even know what that's worth now but man what a sight to see that was an absolute barn burner at number five and rampage is in a 2-5 cash game at the casino royale on saint martin some people have all the travel luck don't they did someone say cracked aces jackpot? No? No? <sighs> no. Let's move on to pocket aces in the hijack. Gotta win this one, right? There's an early position player who limps. Another facing another limp. This time I have a really strong hand. I raise it up to $30. Our buddy Wolfgang on the button actually makes the call. Small blind, big blind, limper, all decide to call too. So why not go multi-way, five ways to a freaking flop with aces, and it comes 774 to diamonds. Okay, not a bad flop. And here, action checks to me, and I'm thinking here multi-way, it's a spot where I'm either going to be way ahead or way behind if someone could have a seven. I obviously am never really going to have a seven too often as played pre-flop, so I check it over to the button player, and Wolfie decides to bet out $30. Swalwin makes the call, and other players fold to me. Aces here. As played, I am just going to make the call. I think raising is a little bit of an overplay. So we're going to see a turn three ways, which comes a queen. Now the small blind decides to lead for $75. Thinking it's a pretty weird spot to be in. I guess he could have like the queen high flush draw, which would give him top pair and a flush draw. Anyways, I'm pretty praying he doesn't have a seven. And at this point of the night, everyone's either tired or really drunk. So I have aces. I make the call. Wolfgang folds. We're off to a river now, which comes another seven. Wow. Okay. Looks like we don't really have to be afraid of a seven anymore. I mean, we're sitting with the second nuts and only losing to quads. And, you know, quads are pretty hard to make. Surprisingly, he decides to check. And I look at his stack. He's got about $800 in there. And I think this is a pretty good spot to go all in. A 2x jam compared to the size of the pot. And I get value from all queens, some buff catchers, and obviously we just have the second nuts. I rip it all in, and he, he, he calls. He calls quickly with 7-4 of spades. That is a pretty good hand, sir. <sighs> he flopped a boat, pretty much flopped us dead, and rivered quads and gets paid. What a sick life for him to check on the river after making quads and getting ripped all in into. Can you imagine that situation? You get quads and then someone goes all in in front of your eyes? Can't make it up. I lose with aces here with the second nuts. Pretty painful hand to play.
at number four this week. And Poker Face Ash is playing in a 2-5 cash game at the 52 Social Club in Round Rock, Texas. And you all know by now that I hate running it twice. But let's see if it pans out for Ash in this one. In this hand, Joey the Mush puts the $10 straddle on under the gun. Ryan DePaulo is next to act with King-10 offsuit and he raises to $30. Almost the entire table calls and I complete in the small blind with Jack-9 of spades, so we're going six ways to a flop. The flop is Jack-9-7 rainbow, so we flop top two pair here. However, there is a straight available. I check, Ryan checks, it checks over to lucrative, and he decides to stab at this one with his pair and gut shot straight draw, and he bets. $50. I wasn't quite sure what to do. I think I can raise here, but I elected to call and see what develops. So I make the call and then Ryan puts in the check raise to $225. It's back on lucrative and he can't continue here. So he thinks for a little bit and then puts in the reluctant fold. I was actually really happy to see lucrative fold here because in this formation, he would be the one most likely to have 10-8. So now it's back on me. I actually don't hate to see Ryan's raise here given that the only hand that he has here that has me beat is obviously 10-8 and he doesn't have that many combos of that because raising under the gun he should only have the suited variety of 10-8. If he's check raising because he has a set of jacks, nines, or sevens, well we're happy to get it in. Although it's extremely unlikely he has a set of jacks or nines given that we block that so his most likely holding is, is over pairs, a straight, or pocket sevens. Or a hand exactly kind of like he has. So I think, and as you can see, I count my stack and as soon as I count my stack and realize I have about 770 bucks behind, I think the best play here is to shove. I don't think any other play makes sense. So I shove and then Ryan goes into the tank. And the only real decision he's trying to make here is seeing if he has the correct odds to make the call with his double gutter. A double gutter is basically an open-ended straight draw. So he has a decent amount of equity in this pot. He has about 35% equity. So after he thinks for a little bit and does the math, he does put in the call and he asks how many times I want to run it. And again, in these bigger games and being a little bit nervous, I did decide to run it twice. So we head to see two turns and two rivers. On the first board, he does end up making a straight, and on the second board, we make a full house on the turn, so we grab our chips back and chop this one up. Phew. Top three this week then, starting at number three, and Ashley Sleaf is playing in a $200 tournament at the Win in Vegas. And there's some good analysis here from Ashley, but how do you deal with an opponent like this? So I have a lot of momentum coming into this hand. Under the gun to just limps for 1200. Small blind makes the call. And I'm in the big blind with ace king offsuit. I raise this one up. I choose 7,000. And under the gun two calls and small blind puts out 2,500. I think he thought that the 5K chip was a 500. So he stuck in 2,500 accidentally. When the dealer said, no, it's 7K, I pointed to the bet. So he reluctantly tosses in his 5K chip and then immediately starts glaring at me. The dealer is scooping in the pot and this guy is just staring me down. He's right next to me. He's a big guy. The only reason I bring this up is because if you're a newer player, and this was happening to you, it might make you feel highly uncomfortable and not want to come back. And I just want to kind of put it out there to remember that these things happen and it has nothing to do with you personally. It has everything to do with the person acting this way. And in this case, I honestly think he just was upset that he found himself in a much bigger pot than he wanted to be in and was kind of just taking it out on me and thought, you know, he could get away with it by just staring at me. Once the dealer puts out the flop of queen six, six rainbow, he's still looking at me and not acting. So I just calmly look at him and ask, did you check already? No. He doesn't respond, but I think it kind of snapped him out of it and he does eventually check it over to me. With that out of the way, I see bet for 7,000. Under the gun two makes the call and small blind gets out of the way. The two of us see the four of clubs on the turn. So I have to kind of just shake off the small blinds situation and kind of refocus on the action here. The flop is something I would always do. See betting on this flop, pretty dry. If they have a queen, they'll continue. But this under the gun two player was a limper and the small blind was just completing. So their ranges are pretty weak. When they do call my three bet pre, they have low pocket pairs. They could have middling suited connectors, potentially a very weak 
Queen X holding. So I think that I just wanted to continue the aggression and get him off of all of those pairs that still are ahead of me, but that I will have trouble getting to showdown against. That's what I end up doing. I go all in, put max pressure on my under the gun two opponent. He had about 23K behind, so he does lay it down and we get a nice little bluff through. At two this week, and Mariano is playing in a 5-10 game at the brand new Resorts World in Vegas. And in this hand, it feels like all your birthdays have come at once against exactly the right opponent. A few minutes later, there's a race to $40 from late position, and I'm in a small blind with Queen-9 suited. Considering that this game is a timed collection, I think it's okay to take a chill pill in the small blind, so I just call, and the big blind folds. Two of us go into a flop of 9-8 deuce with one club. I check and he bets $30. With so many sketchy turn cards available and the fact that this board is pretty good for me, I think a raise here with top pair is reasonable. Maybe not every time, but I do raise it up this time to 110. My opponent seems unbothered by this and quickly raises again, making it 220. No idea what's going on here with that small raise, but of course I'm not going anywhere yet. The turn is great, the queen of hearts, but this time when I check, he checks it back. Okay, off to a river, which gets even better for me than nine of hearts. It does bring a backdoor flush, but it seems nearly impossible that either of us would have that. So I decided to lead out with a big bet, just like I would with all my other missed draws. Also, my opponent in this hand is the same player who bluffed me with 4-3 offsuit, so I do wonder if there's some merit to checking against someone who likes to bluff, but I think just leading is probably better in case he has a hand that might check back, like pocket tens or jacks or whatever. Anyway, after some deliberation, he does decide on a call. I turn it over, and somehow he shows Jack Deuce of Hearts for a rivered flush. Not sure if he was thinking about raising or folding, but either way, nice to be on the right side of a cooler. At number one this week, and it's the second time for Close to Broke, he's playing in a 2-5 cash game at the Resorts World in Vegas. And just watch this one, guys. You really do have to wonder what the opponent is calling with in this hand. Maybe it's becoming a regular thing, but... Ah, don't even want to ruin this hand. Let's hop into some craziness. Bear with me because the video does catch up here on the flop, but there's some pre-flop action to go over. Early position, Doc limps here for 20 bucks, gets to me on the cutoff or the button, excuse me, and I decide to raise to $100 as an isolation after I look down at King Jack of Hearts. My opponent from the small blind, who seems to be like a pro, maybe not, maybe he is, I don't know, but he seems like a pro, he decides to 3-bet to 260 bucks. Folds back over to me for less than 3x in position. I mean, this is like you're serving me up a platter here. Maybe I'm getting dunked on by pocket aces, but I don't know. To me, it feels like uh, this is an easy call. We're going to go ahead and call in position with a suited Broadway, and the flop is absolutely majestic. Queen 10 4 with two hearts and a spade. Not only do we flop ourselves an over, we flop ourselves a flush draw and a straight draw. We have two ways to make the nuts here. As the queen is the queen of hearts, we do flop that second nut flush draw as well as a beautiful open-ended straight draw. Ton of equity here when my opponent decides to see bet for $240. I'm never going to be folding, and I think raising might be the better play. We're both playing somewhere in the neighborhood of like five or 5500 to start the hand. And to me, it's probably best with this much equity, no matter what he's holding, to get most of the money in the middle. I decide to raise this $700 to allow myself an out. If we don't hit our equity, maybe we can blast off by three barreling. But more than likely, at least build a pot so if we get there, it's more likely that we can make some kind of crazy play up. My opponent ends up making the call, and we're going off to a turn card that is unbelievable. The turn comes an ace of hearts. So now there is no question in our hearts, as we know, we have the nuts. That's it. We just have it. We got it. He checks it over to me, and at this point, I end up doing something ridiculous. This is when GTO is kind of thrown out of the window, maybe, or maybe it's right. Who knows? But I just go on the side of aggression. At this exact moment, I feel like my opponent has a very strong holding. If you're going to see bet the flop, call a raise on a very dynamic board, at the very least, I think my opponent has somewhere in the neighborhood of two pair or 
you know, top two pair is very likely. He can easily have ace queen here. My opponent can easily have pocket aces and pocket queens. I don't want to see an action killing card come on the river, whether that's a straight card, whether that's a heart. And if that's the case, I'm going to do something ridiculous. I end up deciding to jam $4,420 into the middle. If you're doing the math, that is over 2x the pot size. That seems ridiculous in many regards, and I'm not here to tell you guys whether that's a great play or a bad play. I just know that at this juncture, in my head, I think my opponent has a hand that he's incapable of folding. And if that's the case, whether that is, you know, tagged as exploitative or theoretical, I don't care. My goal is to get as much money, whether I think that I have the best hand or, you know, in times where I am bluffing here, I want to give the most pressure to allow my opponent to make a big fold. Either way, after a brief tank, my opponent decides on a call. Oh my goodness, I can't believe it. My opponent looks at me and I immediately let him know if he does not have a set or two pair, he's drawing dead. He lets me know that that is not the case, that he does not have a set. And I'd say, we're going to go ahead and run it once, dealer. The river card comes a beautiful brick as it comes a three of hearts. So I guess if he had five deuce of hearts, he would have had the nuts actually. But either way... An unbelievably massive pot. Another over five digit pot in our favor. And what is that? I can't even do math. What is that? Like a 500 big blind pot or 600 big blinds? I'm going to take that every day of the week. Let's go. Nice work. Close to broke. That was excellent and always nice to be scooping in such an enormous pot. Well, that's it for this week, everybody. Another top 10 in the bag. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed putting it together. If you did, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Every new subscription really helps the channel a bunch. Until next week then, good luck at the felt.